let's forget about how many of you have invested in Bitcoin. How many of you have just heard of Bitcoin or blockchain? Now, how many of you feel like you understand it? Okay, perfect. Then this presentation is made for you. So, how blockchain will change the way you develop medical devices. Uh, it's a little bit of a clickbaity title. It's not going to completely revolutionize how you build medical devices, but it is going to revolutionize how that data flows in the background and how effective your medical devices can be and how they can take advantage of the data going around. So I'd like to give a thank you to 10XTS. They helped me get out here. They are a blockchain venture lab building enterprise uh, blockchain products and solutions. So if you're interested in learning more about, uh, about blockchain or you want to try and implement blockchain into what you're doing, check out 10XTS.com. So who am I? Like I said, I'm Jad Mubaslet. I have a bit of a unique background that kind of makes me, uh, I'd like to think that this is the perfect scenario for me to talk about blockchain and also healthcare. My academic background, uh, I have a bio, biomedical engineering degree from Ohio State University, focused on tissue engineering, and I also just recently got my master's, uh, my master's degree in industrial and human factors engineering from Wright State University, where I study the application of blockchain to the healthcare space, specifically care coordination, but medical devices just as well fit inside of this entire healthcare ecosystem. I'm also the organizer of the Dayton Bitcoin Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Meetup, and like Joe mentioned, I founded a, a Bitcoin exchange back in 2013. We were acquired back in 2016, so I'm just an advisor for them now, um, but they're actually still going strong, so if you do want to dip your toes in the water, buy some Bitcoin, go check out bitquick.co. So I mentioned I was working on a master's thesis that focused on uh, blockchain and healthcare. If you want to check out the full paper, 9xc.us backslash 10x, demonstrating the functionality and efficacy of blockchain-based systems in healthcare using simulation tools. So within that, uh, within that paper, you'll find some more directed readings in the literature review that kind of, some of those actually go in depth of all the different applications that blockchain can have in the biomedical and healthcare space. And we also have an in-depth review of how does blockchain and Bitcoin work and how can we simulate this in a healthcare system. So first, if we want to understand how this technology is going to revolutionize the, the healthcare industry, finance, uh, I mean, even past these two industries, uh, think about real estate, multiple industries are going to be affected by this. It's similar to thinking about the internet didn't necessarily change how medical devices were made, but the fact that your medical devices can now be connected to the internet changes the way you think about things. So now, hopefully after this presentation, the fact that blockchain exists and, and how blockchain functions will hopefully get your mind to think about what additional capabilities your medical devices could have. So let's start with Bitcoin, the original blockchain. It was released in 2009 after the financial crisis by a pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. No one really knows who that is, and it doesn't really matter. They released some open source code and a white paper that described it. People just ran with it from there. So what Bitcoin did, it is a digital currency and a software that for the first time in history allows anyone, anywhere around the globe, to send any amount of money virtually instantly with a low fee and most importantly, without a third party intermediary like a bank or PayPal or Visa, someone telling you who you can and can't send money to. So you're essentially immune to financial censorship in this kind of system. And if we look at Bitcoin and blockchain today, Bitcoin has a market cap of about $117 billion. And if we look at the total market cap of all tradable tokens out there, it's somewhere around $260 billion. Now, if we look maybe just a month ago, it was about three times this amount. So it's a very, this is not financial advice whatsoever. Don't take it as such. We've also seen $8.8 .8 billion raised by these initial coin offerings. Companies creating tokens, saying that these tokens will one day have value or one day will provide some kind of function in our new product. And we also have major players in finance getting involved. You have futures being traded by the CBOE, CME. Uh, so you have even Wall Street involved at this point. So quickly, how does Bitcoin work at a very high level? So let's say Bob wants to send 0.1 Bitcoin to Allison. This creates a transaction that we see at the bottom. This transaction will go float in an unconfirmed transaction pool. So everyone who is running the Bitcoin software, they have a copy of this unconfirmed transaction pool. These transactions aren't final, but we're just trying to broadcast to everyone on a best effort basis that we're trying to have this transaction settled and put into the blockchain. So you've probably heard about miners. It's like, what the heck are these miners doing? They have shovels, they're digging something in the ground. A better term for miners is to think of them as transaction validators. We have people running specialized computers that are trying to group together transactions that are not confirmed yet, 
And every 10 minutes, one of those miners will win a lottery-esque system, put together a block of transactions, and append it to the Bitcoin blockchain. So once your transaction is included inside of one of these blocks, inside of the Bitcoin blockchain, it is now permanently stored in, in an immutable distributed ledger. And these miners are rewarded with Bitcoin for their services. So they're actually incentivized to validate transactions in a, in a proper way, because otherwise, all that power that they're dedicating towards the system, it's gonna go towards nothing. If they attack the system and they put bad transactions in the blockchain, then their investment is going to be worthless. So some key implications. We've created a trustless method to transfer value without a third party. We've created an auditable, provable, immutable log of transactions. Each one of those blocks is cryptographically connected to the previous one. So if we manipulate any content within one block, let's say a block that was mined in 2013 or something like that, everyone will be able to see through cryptography, basically advanced mathematics, that that, uh, that modification is invalid. And third, with these public blockchains like Bitcoin, we have a financial incentive for everyone to behave honestly by rewarding digital tokens to these users and miners. So in the case of Bitcoin, that's, those are Bitcoins. But we also see other cryptocurrencies that, uh, such as Ethereum that rewards Ether to their users. We'll talk briefly about some of these other technologies. So at its heart, a blockchain is simply an append-only cryptographic uh, hash-linked ledger. And we have two types. We have public blockchains and we have permission blockchains. And I imagine that they're going, to, they're going to affect the industry in different ways. Public blockchains, anyone can participate in them. You guys want to go run your own Bitcoin node, run your own Ethereum node, run your own Monero node, you're f feel free to do it. No one is going to tell you that you can or cannot participate in such a system. But the drawback to these systems is there are some privacy concerns. Anyone can go on the Bitcoin blockchain and see transactions that are being made. In fact, there's a lot of speculation that uh, the NSA and whatnot has already been able to de-anonymize some significant percentage of users on the Bitcoin network. We also have scalability issues. Whenever I make a transaction, every single other user on the Bitcoin network is going to have a copy of that transaction in their Bitcoin blockchain. The current Bitcoin blockchain is some 200, 200 gigabytes of data today. So it's quite large, and like I said, it's append only. It's only going to get bigger. So then we look at permissioned blockchains. These are blockchains where the identity of the participants must be known. There is no underlying cryptocurrency incentivizing people to use these. So there, you have uh, privacy benefits in the sense that only the people that are allowed to use the system can see the transactions happening. Scalability, we're not putting transactions from everyone on this blockchain. And it's easier to integrate these with legacy systems. You don't have to haggle and, and discuss with the entire Bitcoin community to get your particular function implemented. You're creating and running your own blockchain. But the drawback is that these private blockchains, they're not going to grow as quickly as public blockchains. Uh, they're censorship prone. The people that are working together, those, let's say, maybe it's six, uh, six EMR providers working together, they are going to, there's a, there's a more centralized point of failure. It only takes compromising six entities in that, in that scenario versus with the Bitcoin network, you've got some thousands of users that are running copies of this ledger. So it's much more difficult to attack a public blockchain than a private blockchain. And so in terms of the implications to you guys, I would, my prediction is that these permission blockchains are going to be easier to integrate with our, um, with the incumbents, the, the industry incumbents. They, Good luck trying to convince Epic to adopt this new public blockchain system. They might be more likely to adopt their own private blockchain. But on the flip side, if we start seeing these healthcare blockchains that are public, that anyone can participate in, that anyone can buy their tokens, the same way that Bitcoin attempted to disrupt finance from the ground up, it's a, it's a product meant for consumers. That's how I might, you might see um, these public healthcare blockchains disrupting the healthcare space. So the private blockchains, they will be implemented from the top down. Whereas the public blockchains, I think in the end, are going to dominate as they will be disrupting from the bottom up. Maybe there's gonna be a lot of consumers using these blockchains and the data will simply be so valuable that, that healthcare incumbents will have to integrate that data into their systems. So quick way to think, do I even need a blockchain for what I'm doing? 
check out this flowchart. So do you need a database? If you don't need a database, you certainly don't need a blockchain. Do you need many people to write to it? We need multiple participants. So if you have multiple participants, all right, we're on the right track. Do those people trust each other? If, if they don't, then great, we're still on the way to needing a blockchain. If they all trust each other, it says you don't need a blockchain. The fact is actually, you might be able to use a private blockchain. And if there's one person in common that they trust, well then you might as well just use that centralized database. You don't really need a blockchain in that case either. But if you answer yes, yes, no, and no, you need a blockchain. So my, study, uh, my studies at university, we focused on care coordination. And within care coordination, we have multiple stakeholders. We've got providers, we've got uh, hospitals, and they, there's interdependence among each other. They need to have access to each other's roles and resources. And the same thing with medical devices, if we have a, uh, a consumer that has, let's say, a Fitbit, it might be useful to have that data being fed into this, this ecosystem so that that information can be actionable immediately. And when we look at blockchain and healthcare, it might be bigger than you think. Um, we're looking at various use cases. We even see medical devices and IoT security down there, uh, Spiritus and Neuromesh. Those are startups working on blockchain with medical devices today. And actually, if we look at, uh, there are let's see, Patientory, Metablock, Medical Chain, and Metashares. These are four blockchain healthcare projects that currently have tradable tokens. And in February, the total value of those four tokens was trading at $400 million. Now, realistically, it's probably somewhere down in like $250 million, uh, as many of you uh, Block Bitcoin holders have been feeling the pain recently. So let's talk about the features and capabilities that a blockchain has. The technical features, we have an immutable ledger. All that information, when it's put in the blockchain, we can't change it, it's cryptographically secured. We have consensus among the participants as to the state of that blockchain. What data do we perceive to be valid? We have a set of rules that we use to determine that. Smart contracts. Now, these aren't present in Bitcoin, but when we look at Ethereum, another blockchain platform, smart contracts are basically um, functions that can automatically execute depending on data that happens on a blockchain. So let's say you want to automatically issue some kind of report if you receive data from a patient uh, that they're, you know, they, they've hit some kind of threshold, some kind of goal for their health. You could have a smart contract automatically trigger some kind of reporting, or a payment could automatically be issued. We're looking at a multi-signature. This is the idea that we can have addresses controlled by multiple parties. Cryptography, that's in, involved in the underlying infrastructure for the entire blockchain, all blockchain-based systems. We also have asset digitization. So we could have, for instance, uh, the ownership of a certain medical device could actually be put on a blockchain and be represented as a token. So if someone holds that particular fraction of a, of a token, fraction of a Bitcoin, that could also mean that they own such a medical device. And these networks are, naturally, they are peer-to-peer. -peer. And these lead to certain operational capabilities. We are now able to transfer value. In the case of Bitcoin, it's just money. But if we look at Ethereum or these other blockchain-based systems like Hyperledger, we're able to actually transfer data from one party to the other. We also have security. We have auditability. Anyone can go look at this blockchain and see the, uh, see the history of the blockchain. And we have decentralization of trust in the sense, even if we're looking at a private blockchain, as opposed to relying on one person to manage all the records, and just look at Equifax, it might not be the best idea. We're now depending on six. That's better than one. Or in the case of a public blockchain, it could be an infinite number of participants. And it's, it's important to note that having an immutable ledger and consensus are the key features that lead to these uh, operational capabilities. And so within, our, uh, within my work for my thesis, we also try to identify what are the healthcare requirements uh, in general. And we see that we have cost reduction, fraud prevention, identity management, record availability. We want HIPAA compliance. We want universality of records, auditability, reconciliation of records, interoperability, and a way to encourage patient engagement. So we see not these operational capabilities, some of them contribute to enabling different healthcare requirements, but we see that auditability enables eight out of the 10 healthcare requirements out there. So just the, the ability to audit the, the records of a certain patient or, a cert, or the data that a certain medical device is outputting, that's going to help you achieve many of the requirements that these healthcare systems have and that these medical devices have. 
So to give you a mental model about how could such a system work? Are we gonna have all this medical data sitting on the blockchain itself? Well, no, that wouldn't be efficient. So what we're gonna do is these, for example, if you see, look at M, this MD chain blockchain. What it's doing is it's storing pointers to the actual local database records. So you're still using the classical databases that we already have, but now we're actually able to link them together using, using the blockchain. So you kind of think of it as the mortar that's connecting these different bricks, these different databases together. And so hospitals, patients, payers, local, uh, local provider offices, they would all be feeding data into their databases, and the databases would be, uh, they would have, you would have record locators on the blockchain to those databases. So what can you all do? Stay aware of blockchain developments. Coindesk.com is a great place to check out just general blockchain news. Consider how blockchain may apply to your use case specifically, and hire developers that are familiar with blockchain. So in conclusion, we see that blockchains, they have the potential to disrupt more than just finance alone. And healthcare systems and the medical devices within them can be greatly improved by implementing these blockchain solutions. If you, have, uh, if you want to send me an email, jadmubasil at gmail.com, or check out, sorry, jadmubasil at gmail.com, and if you want to check out my LinkedIn, jadmubasil.com, feel free to reach out to me. Happy to talk about blockchain, Bitcoin, healthcare, whatever, you name it. And now happy to answer any questions. That was fascinating. And would you say that it's almost certain that blockchain, as I've heard, is the new internet, just as pervasive and as like, it was nothing and now you can't be without it. Is that the future of blockchain? I do believe that, yes. Um, it might be five, maybe even up to 10 years before we actually interact with blockchain ap applications on an everyday basis. In the same way though that, what, back in the 90s, uh, who knew that we were gonna be using the internet every single day for every single thing? Who knew that it would lead to this entire phenomenon of social networking? So I think in the same way, we're gonna see similar disruptions from the blockchain industry. Do you think the average user or average manufacturer is going to know how to use the blockchain or will it be in the background and we don't even know that it's happening? The end goal is for the consumers. You're not gonna have any idea that you're using the blockchain. In the same way, you don't really care how Facebook's backend works, but at the same time- Well, I do now. <laughs> ah, yeah, I guess so, right? Oh. But in the same sense, you want, to, you want to abstract blockchain away from the user and just provide them with the benefits. What would you say is like the most, like if there were an easy case of from where we are to having something on the market, is there one that's just so intuitive for medical devices that it's almost certainly going to lead the way and others will take that as the permission to believe that, yeah, we really have to change the way we're doing business? You know, I, I think it's difficult to predict exactly what's gonna be the killer use case. In the same way, during the dot-com bubble, we had things like pets.com that were popping up. I think in the same sense where we're not so sure what's gonna be the killer application here, but for instance, maybe just looking at provider data um, or having your medical device actually have access to information from other medical devices in a live manner. Maybe it's using a public blockchain and these users are now incentivized to actually participate in the system because they're rewarded with tokens. So there's a lot of different ways it could go. Thank you very much, Jad, that was great. Are you a consultant? Can they hire you for your time and advice? Uh, so I'm not officially doing consulting, um, but I did just graduate and I do have a, I'm gonna start working for a Bitcoin exchange coming here soon. Okay. Um, but like I said, happy to answer any questions and if there are more involved projects, we can talk. Any friend of MDTX is a friend of mine. Jad, thank you so much. Thank you, Joe.